Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks you for joining us. Tonight we have uh, Ron Barber as our speaker. Ron is an explorer by nature, an engineer by profession. He is a mechanical engineer with 40 years at the National Laboratories in California and New Mexico. Ron was born and raised in the oil fields of South America in a small isolated backcountry oil camps. His parents hauled their kids through the mountains, deserts, and jungles, always in search of new adventures. Encountering indigenous cultures and ancient sites has led to a long-term interest in curiosity about ancient civilizations. Ron started the Stone Calendar Project about 13 years ago, studying petroglyph panels to identify light and shadow calendars used by many indigenous cultures throughout the Southwest. The team has worked with the National Park Service, National Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, Native tribes, and private landowners to identify important calendrical sites and to assist in the cultural representation of the sites. The calendar study continues to branch out into many interesting sidetracks, chasing the plume serpents being one of these. Tonight, Ron is here to share some preliminary results of the Stone Calendar project, a hobby that somehow got out of hand. Well, with that, I will turn it over to you, Ron, if you are ready. Um, uh, okay, so I'm just I'm just displaying my uh, a desktop, Richard. That looks okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so, what we're doing with the uh, Stone Calendar is we're studying how indigenous cultures use the sun and moon uh, position to develop calendars. And of course, the, the arc that the sun takes across the sky, it actually changes uh, a little bit every day. And so the shadows and sunlight uh, change every day. So this image in the, in the uh, upper left is a, uh, a summer solstice um, glyph. And during, the, during that time of year, this point of light goes through the center of it uh, about a week, and then it begins to move off. The one on the right is a winter solstice. The one on the lower left here is an equinox. And then this one in the uh, uh, lower right is some indigenous day uh, that uh, the cultural meaning of which uh, uh, has been lost. And uh, this is a little bit of a busy, a, a busy poster here, but this is sort of the region of study. Um, we've uh, been studying generally around the West uh, through the uh, Anasazi or Hisatsinome uh, cultures, Pueblo up and down the Rio Grande, uh, the, the Hornada region here in southern New Mexico, down into the uh, Sierra Madres in Mexico. Uh, we've been studying them in Arizona, uh, in the Sanawa, Hohokam, the Patayan out in the uh, uh, desert country, into Colorado, Fremont up north, and even down into the Trincheras and, and Rio Maya. And so it's been a, a, a broad study. What we see are uh, different designs um, of how the calendars uh, are, are developed. We see different uh, um, accuracies, and different indigenous dates. Uh, I want to say a little bit about the population changes and distribution. Uh, this is the a distribution of the population in the southwest around 1200 AD. Uh, during that time, the Mesa Verde region uh, around the Four Corners was the most po uh, densely populated region in the southwest. When the Spanish came in 1500, in the lower right, you can see a much different distribution of the uh, uh, population. I'm going to show a, uh, uh, a a little video here, and uh, uh, and what you're seeing here is a little bit of a time lapse associated with the changing population, and you can see how, in general, the populations are drifting towards the south. I'll go ahead and play that again. 
And so this is the 1200s. Uh, population is uh, generally up north uh, towards the 1300s. This area is completely depopulated. Uh, in the next 50 years, you can see a thinning out of the population here around 1400. And then by 1450, uh, this is what was left over. And so there's been a lot of movement of uh, populations uh, during the time frame in which we're doing our study. And so the objectives of the, of the Crested Serpent study was, uh, number one, to understand the cultural connection to the calendars. The calendars that we study uh, are mainly spirals, sun symbols, or concentrics. We really can't tell one culturally from another. However, as I go through, you'll be able to see that uh, uh, if there are crested serpents associated with that, then we can di differentiate. Uh, we can also uh, trace the, um, the design of the serpents, and so we can understand a little bit about the cultural migrations. We'll probe a little bit the origins of the uh, serpent traditions and, and help us to understand how it spread a little bit. And of course, many scholars, as I've written down here in, uh, at, at, the, at the bottom of the slide, have suggested a northward diffusion of the Mesoamerican plume serpent. Uh, but in the end, I'll get to a, a slightly different conclusion. Uh, this study is generally in the uh, southwest here. I'm not studying the uh, uh, antlered uh, uh, serpents we see here. Uh, over here in the Mississippian area, we see these types of, of uh, uh, winged serpents. Uh, I spent, uh, my brother and I spent three weeks in Peru studying rock art, and we find some very interesting uh, two-horned serpents uh, similar to what we see in the Southwest. And so there are crested serpents uh, in a much broader area than the Southwest. Uh, this is a typical panel. This is a, a Hopi ancestral panel. Uh, and a lot of these panels, hopefully you guys can see this, there's all kinds of uh, different imagery that's uh, scattered across the panel. This is actually a light wedge that's moving across the panel. And this light wedge will, will move in this direction off the uh, page here during the winter solstice and all the way back over here to the summer solstice. And, um, and of course, uh, the Pueblo 4 and Pueblo 5 panels, uh, Native Americans can identify their religion, mythology, clan symbols, uh, the identification of shrines and ceremonies. Um, some of these have historical events. And of course, as astronomy is uh, one of the things that uh, we're interested in. Uh, however, you know, there's a, there's a lot that we do not understand. This particular panel here is a pre-1300s panel. And so uh, it dates before the Great Migration. And so there is a big discontinuity between today's culture and the culture that developed this. And the Hopi would go out there and a lot of these symbols they don't understand. Whereas if this was a, a Pueblo 4 panel, uh, they would be able to identify a lot of the features in it. Uh, this is the uh, serpent at the bottom here that started the study. Uh, this is uh, located out at Kawaika, uh, it, which is in uh, on Antelope Mesa out at Hopi. Uh, above is the typical Hopi serpent and the Hopi guides. I, I might say that, uh, let me back up just a little bit. The Hopi tribe asked me to come out and uh, uh, work with them to identify their ancestral calendars out at Hopi. And so we spent eight years out there identifying the calendars, uh, working with them and reporting to them uh, what we have found, working with uh, a number of excellent guides there. And we ran across this serpent and a lower serpent here. And of course they looked at that and said, hey, that's not a Hopi serpent. And so this is a, a, an example of a serpent that is brought in by migrants uh, into the area. There's, there's quite a variability in, uh, in horned uh, and then the combined plumed and horned serpents uh, throughout the West. 
this is the uh, uh, ancestral. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, this is the ancestral uh, uh, Hopi serpent in the rock art. This is the contemporary uh, uh, painting. We uh, see these here in the uh, Sedona region. We see these in uh, Kiva murals. Uh, we see similarities uh, between uh, 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 Tewa ancestral and contemporary. I'll talk a little bit about ceramic effigies and then also uh, painted ceramics. And so this is a poster that sort of shows the region uh, in which we find these uh, crested serpents. This is the Four Corners region. Uh, we find them up into uh, southeast Utah. Uh, in the Four Corners area, down the Rio Grande, and uh, up into uh, uh, northern New Mexico. And there's quite a variety of different styles, and what I'll do is I'll just kind of step through these uh, regions one by one. I'll start with uh, Hopi, since that's uh, where most of the work I've been doing the last couple of years. And the Hopi have a unique name. It's called the Pa'alulukong. Uh, I'm not sure if I get it, uh, pronunciation exactly right. Uh, but this is a turn of the century uh, uh, painting, and you can see the single horn here. It's characterized with a single horn. It also has plumes, and it has a very unique accent on the body that identifies this as a specific uh, Pa'alulukong. Uh, this is a little bit more of a contemporary painting. You can see the single horn here. You can see the plumes. You might not be able to see too closely, but they uh, still incorporate uh, the same type of uh, uh, body accents that they've had historically. These are also uh, some of the turn of the century uh, uh, paintings by native artists. Uh, most of these come from the Bureau of Ethnographic uh, um, Reports. And you can see the single horn on both of these. Uh, this one's a little bit difficult to see, but here you can clearly see the uh, body accents. In the rock art, we see uh, slightly different variations. We see the characteristic rounded nose. This has a small little horn. This one seems to lack the plumes on it. Uh, this one has a single horn. It's got plumes. Uh, it's got some body accents on it. Here's an example of a single horn without plumes, but you can see the same type of, uh, I'll, I'll call it a, a animal uh, bird track uh, that the uh, typical ancestral one has on it. Uh, it still maintains its uh, similar form in the uh, contemporary uh, arts. Uh, you will see these uh, terminated at times with a, a terraced tail. Uh, here you can see uh, a, um, a version of the terraced tail. This painting here is by Robert uh, Yellowhair who was a Navajo uh, artist. I'll talk a little bit more about that one a little bit later. And so the Hopi serpent, uh, the Pa'alulukong has a combination of a single horn and plumes and a unique uh, body marking. Uh, the Zuni uh, uh, Kuluisi similarly has a single horn. You can see it here in blue, this, uh, or, or green, this uh, horn right here. Uh, it's got uh, uh, plumes on it. It also has fur, but it has a different body marking on it, uh, uh, identifying it as the Koloisi. You'll see that uh, uh, this is from a, uh, um, a, a version of the serpent that's bringing the flood to destroy the evil that exists in a village. And this is sort of a, a recurring theme that occurs in uh, 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 Pueblo mythology. Again, you can see the single horn, the plumes, the hair. And if you look closely, you can see the uh, little cup symbols. Uh, this is from a private collection at the uh, inn at Holona. Uh, these are some uh, 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 paintings that are from the uh, uh, BAE reports. 
In Zuni, you see it in the uh, three-dimensional ceramics. You see it on the painted ceramics. And you see these uh, carved effigies. Uh, and this is the small little horn on the effigy. It's not, uh, not very pronounced. And uh, what I'm going to do here is, um, is I'm going to uh, jump up into this region of Utah and talk about the uh, archaic uh, Barrier Canyon style pictographs. Uh, are you able to see the, the bottom of the biograph uh, yes. uh, okay? <clears throat> yes. Okay, good. So there, um, there are many Barrier Canyon uh, style pictographs that are depicted with serpents. Uh, some percentage of these are, are crested serpents. Uh, and the crest isn't quite clear whether it's horns or plumes or ears. Uh, this, this is uh, one, this is at the uh, uh, Sago Thompson uh, panel. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, horns here. This serpent here uh, looks like perhaps it might have uh, something coming off the head. Maybe it's a horn, maybe it's plumes, we're not quite sure. A lot of these, uh, some of them are alone, some of them are being handled by uh, uh, serpents. Uh, the Barrier Canyon style is believed to be at least several thousand years BC. However, there are some references uh, that put it out there uh, at least 8,000 years old. And, uh, and so these are probably some of the earliest ones we see in the Southwest. These two images uh, have been de-stretched uh, a little bit to um, enhance the image. Uh, this particular image is from uh, Molin Reef. It's not quite clear to me whether it's a, a, a Barrier Canyon style or Fremont. Uh, this, uh, the trapezoidal shoulder is typical of uh, Fremont, but here we can see clearly a crested serpent. We would probably interpret that to uh, be uh, horns. This little serpent has a little wisp of something coming off the back of its head. Uh, these two images here are, are clearly uh, Barrier Canyon style going back uh, thousands of years, as well as this one here that's in the uh, San Rafael Swell. Uh, this here is just a little bit of a close-up of this one here. It appears to be a winged body of some kind. Maybe it's got some horns. It's not too clear. Uh, this one here on the right side of the uh, anthropomorph is a little bit clearer. Uh, it seems to have backward sweeping horns, but this one also seems to have uh, some uh, hands or uh, forefeet uh, associated with it. There's another uh, uh, an archaic style, and these we have found down in uh, Chevalon Canyon, uh, not too far from you guys. Um, and so on this panel here, there's a couple of little serpents here. This is a, a close-up to it, and it looks like it's got uh, uh, two sets of horns, or maybe these are mandibles. Not quite clear, but at least it's a serpent of some kind. It looks like it's got a head and something coming out of the uh, top of it. Um, these are associated with the uh, uh, Glen Canyon uh, 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 linear style, uh, which again, I think goes back several thousand uh, years BC. Might also mention that uh, nearby is the uh, uh, sandal shelter where some yucca uh, sandals were found and dated uh, uh, to be about 8,000 years old. And so the occupation of this area uh, goes back quite a, quite a long time. And so again, this might be an indication of an early crested serpent tradition developing about the same time that the BCS is. Uh, to the uh, uh, north of the Barrier Canyon style region is Nine Mile Canyon. And uh, these are some examples of the uh, horned serpents there. See a, a, a two horned serpent here. This one here, it looks like, uh, you know, who knows what's coming off the back of the head. 
These are, I think, a little bit uh, clearer as uh, being two-horned serpents. And there are a lot of these throughout uh, Nine Mile Canyon and also uh, throughout the Fremont area. Here's a couple more from Nine Mile Canyon that are slightly different style. Uh, this appears to, to be a, a serpent body of some kind. It's got some horns on it. Again, a serpent body, not quite sure what it is that's coming off of this. And uh, this here might also be. And uh, this, this particular one's also in uh, Nine Mile Canyon. And so the large number of these in that we see in Nine Mile Canyon, and I would say broader throughout Fremont, indicates that there's a fairly strong tradition of this uh, in the Fremont culture. It's interesting to see the similarities between uh, this, this uh, later period Fremont, which might be maybe 12 to 1400 and the barrier canyon style down in buckhorn draw which might be thousands of years old and so we can see some similarities and this is one where it's not quite clear exactly what that uh is on its head is it ears is it horns is it plumes and uh and so this has probably changed over time um we see uh uh, the horned serpent imagery in uh, pictographs and petroglyphs in uh, Basket Maker and early Pueblo. Uh, this one at Sand Island, um, River House, uh, John's Canyon. Uh, and then uh, these are crested serpents from uh, uh, the um, near the Little Colorado Basin. Uh, and these are... These two are about, oh, maybe 200 yards apart. They seem to be similar. Um, they both seem to have a head with multiple projections coming out of it. Again, this is another case of we aren't quite sure what is it that's coming out of the top of, of, uh, of the crest of these serpents here. It's a little warm. Um, now, what's interesting is to the north in the Mesa Verde area is the lack of the crested serpent tradition. We know from the migration studies and that video that I showed you that they emptied that region out really? by 1300. I pick up my computer and look at this guy, one, two, three down. And um, can we get him muted? <laughs> Uh, and, um, and, and the migrants from, from Mesa Verde traveled south. And so the fact that we don't find them up there uh, leads me to think that this was not the origin of the uh, crested, uh, either horned or plumed serpent traditions that we see to the south. And um, there are a few areas. Uh, these are some de-stretched uh, uh, pictographs that I found that, uh, you know, they're not very convincing, especially after studying many thousands of uh, petroglyphs. If we move further south into Chaco, uh, this is a, a very interesting uh, ceramic effigy that was uh, found at Una Vida around 1950. Uh, and I was able to locate it in the uh, 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 Hibben Center uh, here in Albuquerque, and they brought it out for me to uh, study. And so it, it, it has a very similar appearance to serpents in the area uh, that post-date this. And so it's got two nice horns. It's got a snout, uh, teeth, the big bug eyes, and this is sort of characteristic of what we see in the Tewa region. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with this. Oh, and, yes. Uh, and so this is a really, uh, it, uh, Richard, we were talking about, I think this is the only one of a kind that uh, I have seen. And uh, and so, uh, you know, it's its neck seems to be kind of hollowed out. Uh, I don't know if, if Yellowhair used this as his reference 
for this image in his painting. Uh, but you'll see on some of the other ones from the region that there is a mosaic collar uh, that is uh, painted on some of the serpents. Uh, I would say this little divot in the head, there was probably something placed in there, maybe plumes, maybe horns. Uh, I don't really know. But if you guys have uh, anything else on this, uh, I would be interested in in uh, uh, getting some more information on that. Uh, I'm going to jump over into the uh, Rio Grande Valley now and uh, uh, work up and down and uh, down into uh, Mexico here. And so Pottery Mound is uh, south of uh, Albuquerque. And in the Kiva murals, we see a, a, a very clear presence of both uh, plumes and horn. And so we see uh, a, a forward sweeping horn, we see a back sweeping horn, uh, we see uh, 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 plumes attached to them. This is an example of a plumed and horned serpent with a mosaic uh, collar on it. And uh, you also notice uh, this one has these uh, circular uh, body accents uh, along it. Uh, we'll see that in some other serpents. Not too far from there, uh, in the uh, area around Isleta, we see these two warrior figures uh, appearing to confront these horned serpents. Uh, the one on the left here is in Tanabo Canyon. Uh, the one on the right is at uh, Cerro Las Lunas. And uh, this is not too far from uh, Isleta is the, uh, 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 the closest, I would say, currently occupied. Uh, they have a specific name for their uh, serpent deity. It's called uh, Ikaina. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Interestingly enough, there is a myth of the uh, twins who confront the serpent and uh, fight the serpent in order to regain their uh, father's uh, heart, who is the son. And they're helped by the lion, the bear, and the eagle. And it's interesting, in this one over the left here, you see what appears to be a, uh, uh, a paw with uh, curved paws. And so perhaps that's uh, uh, representing uh, a mountain lion. Uh, on this one here, you can see uh, a few little uh, circular body accents. Uh, you'll see at the bends these little appendages coming off. Perhaps those are meant to be plumes, not quite sure. Uh, this one on the right, uh, it ends in a, uh, uh, a cloud terrace tail, and that we see uh, quite common. Not too far from there are these uh, uh, twin serpents in a Tanabo uh, side canyon. They both appear to have a single horn, and it's not quite sure what these little projections are coming off the head. Maybe they're plumes, maybe they're ears. Um, in this one, we see these little circular uh, appendages or designs here, very similar to the... Uh, uh, pottery mound uh, murals. We also see these little uh, appendages coming off of here and a few little body accents on this one here. And it's interesting in the region, uh, uh, noting some of the similarities and some of the differences uh, in the heads. This is in, this is a pictograph uh, in the same region. You can see this characteristically round head a short little square snout, very similar to what we see here. Uh, part of the uh, uh, paint is chipped off, but it appears to have a large forward arching horn. And then perhaps some plumes, uh, there's multicolored plumes coming off the uh, uh, back here. Some of the other serpents, again, seem to have a single horn uh, with some other projections here. Here's a horn coming up, perhaps some plumes. And um, uh, whereas this one seems to have a straight horn. And uh, so there's some similarities and some differences. Now in an overhang nearby uh, is uh, this image here. 
uh, human figure with a serpent. Uh, I've sort of uh, digitally uh, colored it in. You can see again the these circular body accents, very similar to what you see at uh, a Pottery Mound. These little winglets maybe coming off of here. And as hard as I could, there was just no way I could I could pull out the head of the serpent uh, or the head of the uh, a human here. But the serpent bodies uh, tend to have a lot of similarities. Uh, when we get into uh, uh, the upper Rio Grande, uh, this is a, a, a typical a venue. Uh, you see it in the uh, ceramics. Uh, you see this, um, I'll call it a tassel for lack of any, any other description, this tassel that's attached to the horns. And typically it has three points here. And you can see it on the ceramics and you see it on, on a lot of the paintings. Uh, the Kiris uh, also have their own form of the uh, uh, of the uh, horned serpent. Are those modern day pottery? Uh, this uh, this one this one is this one comes from a BAE reference around the turn of the century, so it's most likely a, a modern ceramic. Uh, on the Pajarito Plateau, uh, right in our uh, backyard here, there's a there's a very strong horned serpent uh, tradition. Uh, here you can see the undulating serpent. You can see the uh, uh, a, a terrace tail, backward sweeping horn. Uh, this one's probably about uh, 20 miles away. Um, and you can see a, a difference between the Tanabo area uh, a little bit larger snout, um, backward sweeping horn. They also have uh, uh, two horned serpents. Here's an example of one. This is an example of a, of a single horned. Uh, again, a double horned serpent with uh, these little um, appendages coming off the bends. The Galisteo Basin is full of of uh, single horn and uh, double horn serpents. Uh, this particular one's out at uh, San Cristobal. Um, this one I think is near the uh, uh, hand site. Uh, large serpents too. Uh, I think this serpent here is about uh, 30 feet long. This particular one, I think both of these are near uh, uh, Pueblo Blanco. And, uh, and so you see uh, uh, a, a very evident uh, um, terrace tail on this one here. And so in this region, you see uh, both single horn uh, and double horn moving out of the Galisteo to La Bajada. Uh, slightly different designs. You, you find a lot of them that are similar to what I've shown you here. So I've just pulled out some that are just slightly different. This one's rather interesting. The snake is made up of a series of rings, but you can see the uh, uh, double horn on it. This particular one's got some uh, double horns, a single horn here. White Rock Canyon is another area that has a strong concentration of serpents. Uh, now at Mesa Prieta, uh, they have on the order of 800 serpents recorded at Mesa Prieta. And this is based on about 1.3% of the images being serpents. They haven't uploaded all of the imagery um, but this is the projection. I think the projected number is about 780 uh, on the preserve there. And out of these, about 95% are double horned and about 5% are uh, single horned. And so uh, if, we, if we take a look at this map here, uh, the region where these are recorded is probably about the size of one of those dots there. And if you include the broader region here, if you include White Rock Canyon, uh, the Galisteo Basin, uh, La Bajada, uh, La Cienaguilla, and so on, 
uh, right here in the uh, heart of the of the Tewa lands, there are many, many thousands of these serpents. And all of these serpents that at least that I have seen so far are horned serpents, either single horned or uh, two horned. And so the tradition is very, very strong uh, right in this region here. Uh, we're going to move down here towards uh, uh, to Roswell. And so uh, at uh, Fox Place, this is a, a, a pit house uh, mural. Here's a photograph of the mural uh, artist's reconstruction. And if we applied uh, colors to it, uh, this is the color, the uh, colors of what it would look like. It would be a brown plastered wall with a green, green head, white body, uh, a tooth, and uh, a horn that is certainly much different than what we see uh, up north here. And it's not quite clear what this black is on the back. Perhaps it's meant to be plumes or something else. Uh, and then the uh, uh, the report also mentions that there's a, a similar serpent uh, that is on another wall facing this one at 90 degrees. And so there's actually a pair of these facing each other uh, in the corner. And uh, so a slightly different design uh, out in the uh, Roswell area. There's a very interesting serpent uh, way out here in the panhandle of Texas, uh, not too far from Amarillo. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a drawing of it in, the, uh, uh, in Kirtland's book, Rock Art of the Texas Indians. And um, in 1853, uh, uh, Lieutenant Whipple of the U.S. Army was passing through. There's a, a place there called um, Rocky Dell Spring. People would stop there for water. And he just happened to encounter uh, Pueblo Indians who were out hunting buffalo on the plains. And they identified this creature uh, as, as, as their water snake. And they mentioned that it was the guardian of the water source. And it was created uh, by them uh, to provide rain and to preserve the lives of those who, who pray to it. And so this is, this is fortuitous that we have this intelligence. Uh, otherwise, we might assume that maybe the Plains Indians had this, but the Puebloan Indians identified this as their deity. Uh, this is located at this point in time. The the closest pueblo was uh, uh, probably Pecos, which is about 180 miles. And so this is this is a good example of a roaming tribe that has carried their their religious imagery with them uh, wherever they went. And so we're probably some of the imagery we see throughout the Southwest. Is, is done by migrants or people that are on the move, such as these Pueblo Indians. Uh, as we move down south into Mimbris, there's a, a, a very strong ceramic uh, uh, imagery uh, associated with uh, the uh, serpents. We see it in uh, uh, ceramics. I don't know that I have seen it in any Mimbris rock art. Um, not too far from uh, Ruidoso is uh, this serpent here. The left image is a uh, photograph. The right image is uh, de-stretched. Uh, it emerges out of this crack in the rock and right below the crack is a spring. And um, it's really interesting. It's uh, again, head slightly different. You can see the forward uh, uh, curved horn, big eye. It actually has some teeth on it. And there are some of these tassel-like images that we see up north in uh, Tewa. Uh, but we see that associated with this serpent here. And so here is the uh, a photograph. You can see the de-stretch. And uh, these are, are you, you can see the similarities 
in these little tassels to the contemporary Tewa up north. Uh, and here we see it on the ceramics. And as far as I know, I think, I think this is the only ancestral site where we find these images. We find these images in the contemporary uh, Tewa ceramics, uh, but we don't find it, at least I've not found it uh, in the rock art. And if you talk to the Tewa, they'll tell you that uh, one interpretation is that this uh, represents moisture, either rain or spring uh, water. Uh, Alamo Mountain is down along the uh, New Mexico-Texas uh, border. Uh, there's a number of, uh, of, of horned uh, serpents there, uh, slightly different uh, uh, styles there. Uh, Alamo Mountain is another mountain that has some very important springs and uh, migrants that are moving through may very well have left these images there. Throughout the Hornada, there's a very strong tradition. Uh, most of them are, uh, are single horned. We find them in petroglyphs. We find them in pictographs. Uh, here's a, a double horn and you can see the uh, uh, body accents on it. Uh, and there are many sites, uh, uh, Fuselman Canyon, the uh, Trans Mountain Road, Frying Pan, and, and so on. And so in the southern Hornada Mogollon, uh, there also appears to be a fairly strong um, tradition of that. In the uh, Waco Tanks, uh, Alamo uh, Canyon, uh, two serpent uh, heads that appear to be very similar to each other. Uh, this, both of these are, are de-stretched, so they're enhanced a little bit. Here you can see a, this, this huge horn uh, over kind of a short blunted snout. Uh, the same here, here's a short snout and you can see this big horn and these hair-like, or maybe they're plumes coming out, you know, around the outside of the horn. Uh, and so both of those, they're not too far from each other. And so both of those seem to be a unique style in their own, having this, this, this very large horn associated with it. Uh, what's interesting, uh, if, if any of you have ever been to Three Rivers, uh, Three Rivers, I think, is listed as having some 20,000 images. Uh, the images are, are intricately done, very detailed, uh, but there's sort of a lack of definitive uh, crested or horn, horned serpents at, uh, at Three Rivers. We see a lot of, of these types of images with backswept horns, but you know, those could be associated with, uh, with bighorn sheep because there's a lot of bighorn sheep uh, imagery there, a lot of bighorn sheep uh, headdresses. Uh, this might be a, a head of a serpent with uh, two horns. Um, and uh, this is probably, I think this is the only forward sweeping. But if you compare this to the detailed uh, rock art that's there at Three Rivers, uh, it doesn't really match it. Uh, these are rather crude and simplistic. Uh, and so for some reason, it, it does not appear to be a strong tradition at Three Rivers, which is kind of surprising because there's a strong tradition north of it. There's a strong tradition south of it. And there's a strong uh, tradition to the east of it. And uh, so it's just one of those curiosities. If we uh, jump from the uh, uh, New Mexico border over into Arizona, uh, the uh, Salado ceramics have these images which have been uh, interpreted to uh, be horned serpents. Uh, the two photographs are uh, from a study I did there uh, this last spring uh, at the uh, Mills uh, Ceramic Collection in Safford, Arizona. If, if you guys are ever going through Safford, make sure you stop and take a look at that uh, uh, collection. And so 
these are the types of uh, images. Uh, it appears as though it's got maybe a snout, an eye, and different type of horns. Uh, here's another kind of a wedge-shaped uh, head, an eye with a pupil, these sort of uh, interlocking horns, and this could be three images. And uh, this uh, sketch here comes out of uh, 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 Patricia Crown's uh, Salado Polychrome uh, Pottery Book, where she uh, lists a number of, of different uh, motifs that she would uh, uh, attribute to uh, horned serpents. I have not studied the rock art too much in that area, uh, but I would not be surprised to find um, crested serpents of some kind uh, in that region. If we move further south into Mexico, uh, Casas Grandes, uh, if you recall from that uh, map of the migrations, uh, that time lapse, a lot of those cultures that migrated from the four corners into the central part of the state, into the lower parts of the state, seem to have passed through uh, Casas Grandes and multiple cultures most likely left their uh, uh, marks there. Uh, this is a, a serpent that we found at uh, Royal de los Monos, which is a little bit south of uh, Casas Grandes. Uh, it's got a nice little undulating body, your typical square snout, large eye, and a horn. Uh, this one, it's hard to tell. It, I mean, it looks more, more like a bird. Uh, this one here is really, uh, uh, I think, uh, really, really hard to define what it is. Uh, but we've studied uh, at places uh, uh, called Piedra Pintada, Rio Fuerte, Rio Mayo, We've studied trinchera sites. We've not identified anything in those regions. However, there are many, many rock art sites down in Mexico uh, yet to look at. Um, but it's very clear that the ceramics uh, show a very strong tradition. And there are many ceramics that have uh, the serpent on it. You can see the mosaic collar on it. Um, and accents and designs along the body. Uh, here's a, here's a two-horned serpent. This one is uh, rather interesting. Here it is uh, folded out. It's an example of one that might be a combined horned and plumed. And so it appears to have a single horn here, backward sweeping uh, plumes. Uh, sort of a mosaic collar and then all kinds of, uh, of, of body accents. And so it appears as though at Casas Grandes, you find both the horned only and a combination of the uh, plumed and horned. What's, in, what's interesting is in this general region right here, uh, you find a, a, a distribution of styles that include horns and plumes. When you get up north of this region, it appears to be uh, horned only. Uh, down in this region, there is a combination of horned and plumes and, uh, uh, and then some uh, horned only. And... Um, uh, and the horned and plumed uh, tradition still survives today, uh, both at Hopi and at Zuni. And I believe those are the only two that uh, have that uh, tradition to this day. What's really interesting is the absence of either plumed and horned or even horned serpents in uh, regions that are mostly in, uh, in Arizona. So shown here in the blue is sort of the ball court region. Uh, these little blue circles are, are uh, uh, the distribution of where we typically find the ball courts. Uh, in this region, there are on the order of uh, 200 ball courts uh, that are found. Uh, and myself and others have been studying these regions here, 
we have found maybe two around the Tucson area that might be horned serpents, but in the tens of thousands of glyphs that have been studied throughout this region, uh, there, there appears to be a, a, a scarcity of these uh, horned or crested serpents. And so we've searched as far north up here in the Sanawa region at uh, Wupaki, Winona, Chavez Pass, <coughs> in the central mountains here of, of Perry Mesa and Sun Valley and out at, out at Gila Bend. And so it's interesting that the, that, that the tradition is clearly different than along the Rio Grande where we find concentrations of them. Uh, it just seems to be very, very weak or perhaps non-existent. And in fact, maybe the two or three that we see are just carried there uh, by migrants and not really uh, associated uh, with them. Um, let me see, I'm gonna go through these real quick so I can wrap it up in a few slides here. Um, I study the Mesoamerican uh, uh, codices for uh, calendar purposes and, and others. And it's interesting to draw some uh, comparisons and some differences and, um, so uh, this is uh, this is uh, from one of the Maya codices. Uh, you can see these uh, circular body marks, and we see that down here on uh, on uh, uh, the the uh, murals at Pottery Mound. Uh, we see throughout the Southwest this checkered collar. Uh, this has a collar of a different kind, but we see this checkered collar uh, in many locations. We see humans handling serpents, uh, uh, you know, from Barrier Canyon style all the way through uh, a, a contemporary arts. And of course, you know, today the Hopi snake dance is uh, uh, still one of those occasions where, where serpents are handled by humans. It's interesting that we see the, the merging of serpents with humans uh, in, uh, in the Southwest as well as in um, in Maya. And so these two are uh, from Maya codices and uh, perhaps there is some similar ideology. Um, what's also interesting is in the, um, the uh, Aztec codices, uh, in the upper right, we see the uh, a plume serpent consuming a man by the head we see this in the Borgia uh, Codex. We see this in the Borbonicus Codex. I'm not exactly sure what the meaning of that is, but it's interesting that we see something similar at Pottery Mound. And so perhaps there is some possible connection uh, between this uh, imagery uh, or this uh, whatever event this is going on uh, it seems to be uh, rather interesting to, to look into this. If we take a look at the, at the distribution uh, in space and in time, uh, yellow here represents the horned only serpent. And so we typically find that in the uh, uh, Four Corners region, uh, up into Fremont culture, very strong, as I mentioned, in the Tewa uh, heartland. Uh, in this region here, uh, both contemporary and uh, uh, ancestral, we find the combined plumed uh, and horned. And, uh, and then we find a mix uh, down in these regions here and an, and an absence of it uh, uh, throughout uh, the Sanawa, Hohokam, and uh, Pattaya. And so if you, if you take a look at the dates, as I said, the you know, the Barrier Canyon style and some of the Glen Canyon uh, uh, um, linear, they go back uh, a couple thousand BC. We find the horned in Basket Maker. We find it in Fremont. Uh, as I said, we don't find it in Hohokam or Sanawa. We find it in these cultures uh, here. And of course, uh, these are these are when when people talk about Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl is is really an Aztec, and so that that comes in the post classic, 
And so we're seeing it, you know, in the Southwest, uh, I would say, you know, about the time that uh, the Olmec are being formed in Zapotec. And so this, this tradition seems to have merged, I think, very early uh, in the Canyonlands of Utah. And we see that tradition carried through into this region here, uh, uh, successively through these cultures here. And so again, I think, uh, you know, these are very early on uh, and we see that persisting in this region. We see it uh, uh, still uh, strong uh, in this region here. This is the area of, of combined plumed and uh, horned. Um, so I don't, I don't think one can discount perhaps some <clears throat> later infusion of Mesoamerican plume serpents coming up through the Rio Grande uh, and perhaps uh, interacting with the horned serpents to provide, uh, or I should say generate or lead to these uh, uh, plume diversions here. Um, we clearly do not see it on the coast here. We've studied sites here, studied sites here. And so it almost appears as though there's a separate uh, diffusion of the ball court uh, culture that came up uh, in this region here. I think to answer the question about the infusion of Mesoamerican plume serpents, uh, we've been as far south as uh, uh, Casas Grandes, actually done a little bit of work down by Chihuahua. But I think, you know, if we did a, a, a further southern investigation, uh, it would be interesting to see, do we see plume serpents as we move closer and closer to the uh, Mexican uh, highlands? Uh, but hey, uh, that'll be some other time. So, uh, okay. So at this time, Richard, I'll open it up to questions, comments, uh, suggestions, ideas. Okay. Yeah, I was, that was very interesting. And it, it sounds like uh, the American Southwest had the, the plumed and uh, horned serpents probably before the the Aztecs? Uh, clearly before the Aztecs. The Aztecs were really late comers. Uh, you know, the, the, the classic Maya is sort of in this region here, and these are considered the uh, 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 pre-Maya. But it's very clear that there's been a long, long-standing tradition uh, all the way through up until today uh, in this region of the Southwest. Right. Were these uh, serpents ever, you know, anybody think that they might have been based on real serpents that might have had plumes and horns like that? Maybe giant ones that were eating humans? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Were you able to hear the, the uh, question? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, so the question is, where does this come from, right? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, were, were these real serpents? I mean, all these tribes carrying this tradition on. Well, it's it's interesting that that it seems to exist in the Southwest. It exists in Mesoamerica. Uh, it exists down in Peru. I, I, I just showed you one uh, one example of a, of a Peruvian horned serpent. Uh, and of course, uh, it's out in the Mississippian cultures. And uh, well, we find it uh, down here in, uh, in the San Francisco mountains uh, in Baja, uh, except there they have what appears to be like a deer antlers. And uh, so I, you know, it, it might be that that way back, maybe five, 10,000 years ago, embedded in these cultures is some mythological crested serpent. And as these, as these people split off into various cultures, they then just refined and developed their own version of it. Uh, anyway, I really don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, 
Is there any indication that the ball court and or serpent motifs generally diffuse southward rather than northward? Oh, uh, hmm. that's a good question. It is a good question. Um, I think, I think, you know, I think the general consensus is, is that the, the ball courts originated in, uh, in Mesoamerica. And I'm already telling you more than I know. <laughs> uh, now, now whether, whether this horned serpent tradition, you know, migrated all the way down uh, into Mesoamerica, I, I'm not sure. As I, as I said, I think I think we see it appearing all over, and so it must go way, way back in time before these individual cultures were formed. It must have been, I, I would think it was indigenous in, you know, maybe the Paleo-Indians that spread throughout the region, uh, but I, there's no way of really knowing. So... Thank you. The ball courts, is that like an actual place where people played ball? Yeah. Yes. Uh, they... In Mesoamerica, they definitely did play a ball game, but I'm not sure whether they did here in the American Southwest. There's a there's a there's a book that uh, uh, Dave Wilcox uh, wrote um, on the uh, ball courts of the of the Southwest, and this type of of a game is still played um, down uh, along the coast in Mexico, and so they still play it. Uh, the ball courts. In this region here, they have found uh, a balls, um, and so I couldn't I couldn't tell you much more than that because I haven't really studied the subject. Uh, the northernmost ball court is north of, of Flagstaff here, and uh, and from this region to Hopi. As the crow flies, it's maybe 50 miles, 50 or 60 miles. And so we've been searching, uh, but on this, on this, on the southern side of the little Colorado River where we find ball courts, we just do not find the crested serpents. There's a there's a rumor of one in the back country, uh, but I haven't gone out to check it yet. Uh, but again, I think we have to be careful if we find one. Because as I showed you way out here in the Texas Panhandle, uh, you know these these mobile uh, people are known to carry their religious iconography. So finding one, I think, is different than a real tradition. And um, I don't know if I answered the ball court question or not. Is the ball court the northernmost one you're referring to? Is that the one at Wupaki? Yes. Yeah. And there's actually a couple of them. Yeah, in fact, this picture here is uh, is the one at uh, Wupaki. Uh, but right near Wupaki at uh, Winona, uh, at Ridge Ruin, there's uh, two courts there. Um, actually, I think I think north of I-40, there's probably uh, maybe four or five ball courts uh, uh, north of I-40. <laughs> Take her on a trip. <laughs> you want to go on a trip? Well, I think you've explained everything very well and uh, piqued a lot of interest in a lot of people. <clears throat> if we don't have any uh, any more questions or uh, comments, uh, I'll go ahead and end the meeting. I want to thank you for joining us, Ron, and we really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so I'll ask you guys if you have. If you have any more information on the on the Hooper Ranch uh, serpent, uh, I, I would be interested because it's so unique. Uh, uh, I'd be interested in, in uh, getting some of that. And again, if you find some really unique serpent, uh, uh, let me know. Um, oh, okay.
May I ask if any of your information is available online or by request via email? Um, I'm I'm writing up a report right now uh, that's going to go into the uh, Hornada research um, publication coming out. There was a conference uh, last June uh, in Tularosa. Uh, it's called the Tularosa Basin Conference. And uh, there'll be a, a short report uh, coming out. Just uh, it'll be very brief, uh, but sort of summarizing uh, uh, what I've talked about here. So, thank you. Yeah, Ron does have other uh, talks to give, and uh, I think we'll be hearing more from him in the future and his group. Okay. Well, you guys have a good evening. All right. Bye. Thank you. Take care.